Coming up on This Week in Computer Hardware, Intel's Ice Lake Gaming Benchmark, AMD's Epic CPU, perfect for 8K encoding, Hey Olympics, Corsair's record-setting 4,866 megahertz memory is too fast to run. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 534, recorded on September 19th, 2019. AMD's Epic CPU and gaming on Intel's Ice Lake. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Plex. With Plex, you can organize and stream your personal collection of movies, TV shows, music, and photos anywhere on any device. Plex is offering Twit listeners a 30-day free trial of Plex Pass, which gives you access to all their premium features. Go to plex.tv slash twit and enter the code TWIT to start your free trial today. Welcome to Twits, this week in computer hardware, Twits weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most engaging, most delightful, most affordable, sometimes most expensive, and this week, most 8K swallowing hardware news on the planet. I'm not really sure what 8K swallowing means. I think it's thread counts and video encoding. And joining us to talk about that and many other things, Jim Tannis, managing editor, PCPer.com, in for Sebastian I'm on vacation peak somewhere in America. Jim, welcome to Twitch, man. Hi. Thank you, Patrick. It's great to be with you. I've watched the show, I've watched you guys, watched you personally since the Tech TV days. So uh, it's a true pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you for making the time for us. This is actually, um, I don't want to, I don't want to sound like I was mocking, but um, when you look at AMD's Epic processor, uh, I think there's a seven seven four two. Is it 64 core, 128 threads on that monster? It is. Yeah, that's their top end Epic. And uh, th this article that you're referring to, the 7742, uh, so that that was their top end. They actually just last night or yesterday, I guess, in Rome released a an additional variant, uh, the 712H or 7H12, I think it was, which is a 280 watt part that bumps the base clock up to 3.6 gigahertz, but requires water cooling. But yes, these huh. are their their monster core counts. They're just they're just inundating the enterprise market with cores and threads, beating what Intel can bring at least right now, and it's opening up new opportunities for for stuff you couldn't do before, as well as doing stuff on a smaller scale, more efficient scale, uh, doing stuff with a single processor that used to require two or four processors. So it's it's what AMD has been able to do with that that server architecture and uh, just threads. Thread, more threads than you can shake a stick at. Or several sticks at at this point. Um, you were yeah. talking about it was Beamer is the company that did the encoding software. Because when you start looking at encoding software, there's not a whole lot out there that's going to take advantage of uh, you know 64 cores, much less 128 threads. Um, did they have any like frames per second number on how fast they were encoding stuff? Or am I thinking of a... No, 70... Was it 79 frames? There it is. Uh, if I could read, yes. it was in the second paragraph. <laughs> the uh, 79 frames per second um, on 8K 10-bit HDR video, uh, HEVC codec. Um, I do not really know how to put this into perspective other than to say uh, I would be blown away by 1080p video uh, or 4K video at 50 frames to the considerably less, you know, CPU intensive like H.264 codec. That's a that's a ridiculous number of frames per second. That's a huge, huge amount of data moving through that app on that processor. Yeah, and it's especially impressive too because of the the conditions. Like when I when I was reading this story and I was looking through, I said, okay, well, 8K, that's that's pretty good. Oh, with the HDR too. Okay, it's 10 bit HDR. All right, fine. HEVC because for anyone who's done any video encoding, you know that HEVC in its current format or its current state is significantly more difficult to encode. Like if you've got a uh, you know a nice yeah. 9900K desktop system, you can do uh, H.264 1080p at you know 60 frames per second probably if you're, if you're tuning right. the presets. HEVC is going to go at maybe 15, 20, and again that's like 1080p standard def or st standard uh, uh, dynamic range. And so when you look at 8K with the HDR and HEVC, uh, that's that's nuts. But it's also important too because they work this company Beamer which does professional uh, video encoding for companies like broadcasters and streamers. Um, they, they worked with AMD to optimize 
their software. It's a proprietary encoding app to take advantage of all those threats. Because that's the other challenge for people who do video encoding is as these thread counts have increased that we've been able to, to buy, they're not very efficient at, at encoding. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you install Handbrake on your new eight core or 16 core Ryzen processor, it's not going to take all, you know, you're not going to peg every CPU thread uh, when you're, Which when you're is a single video. <laughs> Exactly. So in that case, what you do is you, you do multiple encodes at the same time and you try to take advantage of it that way. But being able to throw all that power of that 64 core, 128 thread system at a single video, that's that's also impressive. And it's showing how AMD is working with, with companies in the enterprise and in business to to refine the software. Because that's, that's the challenge. We had a hardware challenge of getting all these cores and threads into a package that could be affordable and, and uh, this, you know, available. And now we have to get the software there too to make sure that the the apps and the services we need are able to actually to actually use it. It's amazing, and a lot of people are out there probably thinking like, "Why do I care about 8K? I barely have 4K." And I, I'm sympathetic to that particular wine. But when you're looking at uh, Japan's looking to start uh, the first 8K channel, I want to say uh, NHK is they're going to launch the first 8K TV channel um, at the end of this year. The Olympics next year are supposed to be uh, recorded and to a limited degree distributed in 8K. Um, ton of panel makers uh, are getting hot and heavy on 8K. Uh, not that there's any particularly good distribution method for most of the world on that one, but uh, what part of makes this so crazy is you know I was I was looking earlier there was an article uh, on a company called Sigenet. Signiant. It's a really difficult name for me to say for some reason, but they did comparisons of file sizes for raw video and raw video is what a lot of broadcasters work with and when you're talking about like 4k pro res which is a uh you know sort of an apple centric uh well i think of it as apple centric it's not entirely true but you're looking at like 318 gigabytes for an hour of video right uh, 4k raw bmpc files are like 740 gigabytes per hour um 1080p you know, you're looking at maybe 200 gigabytes an hour, which is a lot of data until you take a look at like 8K off of a red code camera at seven plus terabytes for an hour of video. So the amount of information you're dealing with, you know, um, is kind of unhinged. Now, it's probably going to be smaller than seven gigabytes for an hour of the Olympic after it comes out of the editing booth or out it comes out of the, the the switching truck. But you're still talking about huge amounts of data and then wanting to process it as close to real time as possible, which is not going to happen until uh, either they do a whole lot of changes to the video or a whole lot of processing, uh, customized processing and software gets developed. But it's... Um, it's nuts. And I mean, it, you mentioned Handbrake, right? Handbrake scales really, really well up to six cores. Um, from two to four cores, you pretty much double your speed. You get another healthy boost going to six cores. And then there's this diminishing returns after that point. So 128 cores. Um, I can't imagine the complications in kind of dealing with the encoding uh, across that many, I should say, threads, not cores, 128 threads. That's... Uh, I don't know. I'm curious. I'm very, very curious, and it's an app I will probably never, never get my hands on. <laughs> well, but everything's got to start somewhere. You know, you get these, you know, yes. like mentioning NHK earlier, the Japanese broadcaster, they were into HD stuff in the 90s. You know, they're always kind of ahead of the curve. So you look to you look to stuff like this to see what are you going to get your hands on in five to 10 years. And and as long as they're keep mo they keep moving on that side, uh, the progress of what trickles down to the rest of us, uh, you know, will be good. You had some interesting uh, information at the tail end of this article from Serve the Home to kind of put the price of this processor in perspective. Now, this is this is this Epic processor, the 7743. This is a $14,000 processor. What did Serve the Home find when they looked at some of the benchmarks in terms of uh, how this compares to some high-end Intel chips? Oh, I do. I want to clarify too. That's that 14,000 is for two of these. So these are about oh, 7,000 each, just under 7,000. Yeah, um, and and so that's and that's pretty good in this realm for, for that. And you compare that to Intel. And so in the serve, serve the home is, if you're not familiar, it's a uh, it's serve the home uh, It's a website that covers enterprise tech servers, a uh, really good resource if you're into this stuff. And uh, so they did a test where they put up two of these 70 Epic 7742 processors. So 64 cores and 128 threads each. They put it up against four Xeon Platinum. These are the Intel parts, 8180Ms. 
that have 28 cores and 56 threads each. The total for those four Intel processors was over $52,000. And the two AMD server parts significantly outperformed the Intel parts in, well, in, well they, they slightly outperformed in single core and significantly outperformed in multi-core, 193,000 to 153,000 in the uh, in the benchmark test. So outperforming at a significantly less cost, and that's really been AMD's push with, with this Zen architecture that they've matured, that's gone from desktop to mobile to server. They, they've been leading on value, and now they're leading on performance too. And so it's really lighting a fire under Intel to to, you know, they've got to respond, they've got to keep going. There are still some applications. These are all very workload specific when you get into the enterprise. You know, a, a slight tweak to the way you do things could make all the difference. And there, there are applications and workloads where Intel still outperforms. But then again, you got to weigh that cost. And so that's that's where Intel's, the, that's the challenge they're facing is looking at, at performance and, and their value, the price per dollar. I'm okay with more value for less money or more performance for less money. Value's mm -hmm. good. <laughs> yeah. Not entirely moving to a value-based conversation, but more giant numbers. Uh, the latest Corsair Vengeance memory, um, they're talking about 4,866 megahertz at CL18. Uh, you're looking at like $1,000 for how many gigabytes of memory on that one? Is that 16? It's two 8 gig, 8 gig, uh, 8 gig dims, so it's not a lot. You're paying for speed, <laughs> not quantity. Speed. Well, but this is this gets interesting because I was uh, laughing is not the right word, but I was coding up memory, looking at uh, you know a next gen Ryzen three thousand processor, and I'm in a situation where I have a very very tiny motherboard, a mini ITX motherboard. I've got two memory slots, and stuffing like thirty two gigabytes or or sixty four gigabytes on two dims or thirty two on on uh, two dims, actually radically lowers the practical speed. What happens as you start to try to, uh, you know, deal with actual? I mean, can you can you? Is there any way to run this on a Ryzen three thousand in any meaningful fashion? Well, well, there is, and and Corsair when they when they announced this, and let's uh, let me make sure I get the product name out there. This is their Corsair Vengeance LPX DDR four memory priced at just under a thousand dollars uh they they said well this is ryzen ready and uh and they uh, for these new ryzen 3000 processors and memory is important for amd and and ryzen uh it, it was it, important or it was more it was trickier in the last couple generations you had to have issues with compatibility or you had to pay attention to issues issues with compatibility now it's it's better with ryzen 3000 but it's still more finicky than say it is on the intel side and that's because with Ryzen, you've got this this Infinity Fabric that is this sort of mm -hmm. very high speed local network on the chip that's communicating with the various components of the chip, and you've got to make sure that you're you're pairing your memory to to accommodate that frequency of that Infinity Fabric. And the the general rule of thumb with Ryzen 3000 is that for best performance, you want to run it synchronously. So you want your Infinity Fabric, your F clock to match your memory clock. And when when you deal with DDR memory, remember it's double. So let's say your, your F clock is 1800. Well, then your memory would be 36. And that's synchronous because it's 36 divided by two for the DDR. So 1800, 1800. With memory this fast, the problem is in order to maintain that ratio, you've got to up that F clock or you've got to run it asynchronously. You've got to run it out of, out of balance. And that will either increase latency or increase stability or, or I'm sorry, increase instability or both. And so faster is not always better. And there's going to be very, very few workloads and very few motherboards and just, just very few scenarios where memory at 4,866 megahertz is going to matter. At that point, you want to go for latency. You want to look at the cast value of your memory, get a lower latency. And uh, there's a great video and an article that Gamers Nexus did a couple of weeks ago where they just tested a bunch of memory on Ryzen 3000. And they can show you on the charts, like the best bet is because of that F clock balance that you want to maintain on your Ryzen processor, go with something like a 3600 megahertz kit, get the lowest latency kit you can afford or find, and then just run it at that 3600 megahertz slash 18 to 1800 on your, on your F clock. And that'll give you the best balance. And if you if you go faster, 
there are some workloads where it might matter. And if you've got a really mm -hmm. good motherboard, it might matter. But for the vast majority of people, don't don't go overboard. 3600 is probably the easiest. And, and if you want to do manual timings, you can go up to 3733. But it then, you know, at that point, you're you're dealing with small percentage gains. So basically, yeah, it's, uh, this is the memory for the guy with the car that he can't actually get out of second gear and down the street. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and it's tricky because uh, with these new processors, so many people are coming to AMD, people who may have been on Intel for mm -hmm. 10 years, and they're coming back to AMD. And with Intel, this is not as important. You get your memory, you go in, you set the XMP profile, faster is better, generally. Uh, and it's it's tricky. So as you, as you shift it back to AMD, you may not realize this, and you may be running your memory in a non-optimal way that's either increasing latency for that infinity fabric or causing instability. So it's, it's uh, pay attention. We used to do this like 15, 20 years ago. The qualified vendor list, which is on you, if you go to your motherboard support site, there's a, a document uh, that lists the memory they've tested. Pay attention to that again. For, for a long time, it wasn't really that important, at least on like consumer desktops. And now it's it's right. getting there again with Ryzen. So so check that out. Check out the QVL qualified vendor list, and that's going to be your best bet. And just make sure you pay attention to that that balance you you strike between what you're running your memory at and what you're running your your processor's Infinity Fabric at. I was laughing when the I was talking to one of the AMD reps when the Ryzen launch, and I was like, really, this is important again? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Potential benchmark leaks for Intel's next HEDT processor based on Cascade Lake, 10-core, uh, 20-thread, 4 gigahertz base, 4.6 boost. Um, you're talking about, uh, or I should say they're talking about Tom's Hardware is talking about somewhere in there. Uh, I'll attribute this. Uh, G. Liu over at Tom's Hardware. Uh, the rumor uh, based on the benchmark that showed up online is a 5 to 10% improvement over the i9-9900X. Um, this is uh, uh, problematic because Intel said earlier this month that Cascade Lake X would offer up to 2x, quote, performance per dollar over Skylake X or Skylake 10, if you prefer. Um, you have a suspicion of how they're going to get to the performance per dollar number, which is not performance. This is um, fiddling. Uh, to use a marketing word. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, because, you know, Intel, um, th this stuff doesn't happen overnight. These these architectures right. and these decisions, Intel and AMD are both, uh, you know, either reaping the rewards or paying the price, however you want to look at it, for decisions that were made years ago. And so as Intel has faced increasing competition from AMD, the only other choice to get to a performance per dollar value proposition is is cut the price. So this Cascade Lake X, which will be Intel's next uh, HED part, HEDT part, high-end desktop, uh, which is expected to launch in the next few months, uh, they they just they can't just miraculously triple performance like like Patrick right. said. These these leaked benchmarks are five to ten percent. So how do you get to that 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 double or what? I think so. Intel at IFA said basically Cascade Lake X will offer 1.75 to 2x performance per dollar uh, benefit over Skylake X. So the only way to get there then is is uh, is price cuts. Now again, also these are leaked benchmarks. These are probably pre-production. It could get a little bit better in the in the actual performance gain, but they're not going to get double. You know that's that's not going to happen. So you know, look forward. I imagine to to price cuts for those high-end desktop uh, parts. And uh, you know, and about time. I mean, we've seen the high-end you know enthusiast processors in the last ten years go from five hundred dollars to seven fifty to a thousand. And then I think was it the 6950X that came out in 2015 or 2016 was $1,700 or 1799. So we've seen these these high-end enthusiast desktop parts go crazy high, and then here comes Ryzen, which is going to launch their 3950X at 750 with 16 cores, 32 threads. So price competition, it's great. Yeah, no, no, no. No arguments here on that one. Um, it's been interesting to watch that. Um, and it's nice to see that. Well, it's nice to see that it sounds like Intel is actually going to acknowledge that maintaining their, you know, their, their margins may not work in the face of actually having a legit competitor in the market. Um, we'll see. I'm kind of curious to see how that one rolls out. Uh, you have got uh, pretty serious about the Whiskey Lake and Ice Lake benchmarks um, over at PC Per. Um, 
this is I we we talked a little bit of this about about this last week and the potential. You know, the tension in the core i7 stuff, this is looking really good. Um, you know, you guys went out, or I, you know, the the, the isolate graphics are, are up to twice as fast. I should just stop speaking and be like, so Jim, were they twice as fast? Um. <laughs> yeah, uh, in, in certain areas, yes. This is a, a tremendous increase. And, and let's be clear what we're talking about here. So this is isolate. This is right. Intel's first widely available 10 nanometer part, long delayed, controversial, it was just a, a struggle to get this thing to the market, and they finally did it. The first systems uh, started launching at the beginning of this month. And in the lead up to this, they were touting this new Gen 11 graphics. They've been talking about this since last fall or last, last winter. So it's been a while. And right. they were saying, you know, this is a new graphics architecture. Uh, it's it's a, uh, uh, a, whole new, uh, or a whole new level of performance. Because in integrated graphics on Intel processors have always been... Uh, inferior to AMD, they're, they're they're adequate for your notebook. They're at, you know, but you're not going to be gaming very well. You're you're not going to be doing any any advanced video encoding using the you know, <laughs> using GP compute. They're wonderful for displaying spreadsheets on your ultra portable. Uh, yeah, you know, gaming. You know, as long as you don't get any closer than maybe five years ago, if you expect anything that resembles decent performance, you're good to go. Um, I'm being a little harsh there, but that's super harsh. This is this was, oh. I mean, we also should point out their numbers. They're talking about two X of not the last generation, but the generation before that, right? Gen nine versus Gen eleven, not Gen eleven versus well, Gen ten. Gen ten didn't exist technically, so uh, they, this is well, tech, so so Gen ten was going to be a Cannon Lake uh, thing, and Cannon Lake was Intel's right. first attempt to get the ten nanometers that that fizzled out. There was one very limited release part that came out without without uh, these level of graphics on them. So so Gen 10, for all intents and purposes, doesn't exist in the market. So, okay. so this is, you know, a, a, from a market perspective, a single generation uh, leap. And they're comparing Whiskey Lake, which was the 15 watt TDP top end part last year, mm -hmm. which was UHD 620, to now Ice Lake, which is their, their top end. And they distinguish their graphics now. They call it Iris Plus graphics. And there's various levels of that. There's the G7 at the top end, which is what we tested. And then there's the G4 and the G1. And the short answer is yes. We didn't match their exact numbers that you just saw on that little chart. Uh, but but overall, we found that it is, it's anywhere from 50 to 100% faster. From gaming to um, rendering, anything that was GPU related is significantly faster on Ice Lake. And that's important because we, we also threw into this article the Picasso system, which is Ryzen 3000 mobile, Zen Plus, not Zen 2 like it is on desktop, which is their their current system in the market. And if you look at, uh, so here, if you look at the, the gray bar and the orange bar, take the blue bar out of the middle, that was the state of the market up until August 31st, up until Ice Lake right. launched. And Ryzen was beating the pants off of Intel in most GPU-related things. And now here comes that blue bar in the middle, here's Ice Lake, and it either it meets or exceeds Ryzen in most things. It, it, it doesn't beat Ryzen in everything, but even where it doesn't beat it, it comes close. And so that's that's a, a, a huge win. These aren't gaming laptops. These aren't uh, video production workstations. These are your Ultrabooks. But what it means is you can now take your Ultrabook that you might have for work or school, and you can go to, uh, you know, go on a trip or, or go to the office. And if you've got a you know, few minutes, you can fire up uh, Fortnite or... Uh, Starcraft or whatever, and you're going to get acceptable frame rates at 1080p, you know, between 30 and 60 FPS, uh, even higher on some older games. So it's it's a great uh, a great advancement for Intel. The problem though is availability. Ice Lake has has launched. They've announced like a dozen systems. The only one we've been able to find, and we were able to buy it. That's how we did this. Was the Dell XPS 13 2 in one. Uh, every other system from every other manufacturer has, is still pending. You know, they they've listed it on their website, but you can't order it. There's no ship date. Uh, there were rumors ahead of this that yields were very low. So we don't know if that's going to play a part. Uh, and the price is high. You know, these are not going to be your cheap systems. The system we tested was about $1,800. Uh, and it wasn't a fully loaded system. It had the top end processor, but it was 512 storage. You know, it wasn't a crazy uh, system. So you're not going to find these on your on your budget builds anytime soon, or your budget laptops anytime soon. Right. And, uh, and then the other... I just want to point out with laptop testing, as always, 
we can't control for everything because you, you have a closed system basically. And so these laptops right. we tested, they're, they're different form factors, different thermal uh, constraints. So this is all we had, that's why we did it because we couldn't find any other ice lake systems. But as more come, <laughs> we may see different performance characteristics, either more either more uh, constrained or, or on a system that has more thermal headroom, maybe even better performance there as well. So, so you're probably not going to get an ice lake system soon. You know, it's going to take a little while for this stuff to right. get out there and we'll see how the prices and availability kind of settle. I'll be really curious to see, given how miserable the the cooling performance has been on some of the laptops, or I should say some of the ultra portables in the last couple of years, I'll be very curious to see what real world experiences are like. Um, I mean, that said, I'm also looking at like Fortnite, 1080p, you know, uh, uh, you know, setting it low. Um, you know, you're talking about going from 31 frames per second to 50 frames per second as an average frame rate. That's uh, that's a pretty huge bump. <laughs> um, yeah, and know, frame times too were, were significantly yeah. improved, and that's important for that smooth gameplay um, because a lot of these games like Fortnite and Overwatch, you know, you can you can very quickly go from a low low complex scene where it's running fine to then something blows up and you're looking at a slideshow, and so. Stable frame times are, are just as important as frame rates, and we saw improvements there as well. Nothing wrong with that, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, my goodness. Uh, we should probably talk, we're talking about one more story. Um, it is a tradition uh, <laughs> from just about every CPU vendor, and I'll just name Intel and AMD to have a TDP that's stated and some staggeringly larger uh, wattage numbers for what actually gets sucked into the CPU in real world usage. I'm not entirely sure how this works because uh, I once saw a 70 watt delta between, I want to say, a 125 watt part and when it was actually running. Um, but uh, there was an Asus motherboard leak looking at the 9900KS. Um, this is not as brutal as some of the worst case scenarios have seen, but what's going on with the, the TDP this motherboard is, is uh, claiming versus the 95 Watts uh, we're seeing on the 9900K. Yeah, so the 9900K as which was announced by Intel right before Computex, it was like their sort of teaser right before AMD launched uh, uh, Ryzen 3000. And uh, it's a, a five gigahertz, it's an eight core 16 thread part. So it's it's the same mm -hmm. basic part as the 9900K, Coffee Lake, uh, 14 nanometer. But what Intel's doing is saying, we're gonna give a base clock of four gigahertz and we're gonna guarantee an all core boost, an all core turbo of five gigahertz. Now you can do that on a well binned 9900K. I mean, you can do it on, even on a somewhat slow, a poorly binned 9900K mm -hmm. if you've got really, really good cooling. But the question was, okay, that's what they told us. We didn't have TDP, we didn't have price, we didn't have availability. Uh, so that's starting to come out now. And it looks like uh, Intel is labeling this uh, 9900KS as 127 watt uh, base TDP compared to the 95 watt for the 9900K. And as Patrick said, with Intel, with, with all CPUs, the base TDP, especially on desktop, it, it, it doesn't really matter. You're never going to run it unless it's just completely idling, it's never going to be at that base TDP. It's always higher. Uh, and But this gives us a good idea of sort of like where where can we go? You know, what is the difference going to be when this thing is really, is really loaded? Because what Intel has done here is really cherry picked the very best 9900Ks and optimized mm -hmm. them and tuned them for this part. And then, of course, in addition to knowing what the price is, the, the fear is if you haven't bought a 9900K and you wanted to go out and buy one, are you going to get a lower quality part? Not not that it won't hit the rated specifications, but you may not get those golden silicon lottery winning samples anymore that give you those good overclocks because Intel's taken them all off the market to to put into this new product. So, and we saw this happen with the if you recall uh, a year or two ago the 8086K anniversary mm -hmm. processor. Um, it was the same thing where they took the uh, 80, uh, or what's see, what was that? The 8700Ks, and they took the very, very best and 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 picked them out. So we we don't we don't know uh, what's what the market is. We don't know what the yields have been on the 9900K, and and if Intel's just got chips to spare. We also again, price is going to be the big the big thing with this part. 
But if, if you don't want to play the Silicon Lottery, you don't want to worry about it. You want Intel to guarantee for you that your, your 9900K will be a 5 gigahertz all-core boost. You'd go and, and you'd, you'd presumably want to pick up this 9900KS. Hmm. I'm going to hold off on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I eh. I mean, I'm actually, I don't know, you know, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to see what the real world performance on that is, uh, especially uh, in light of a story we're going to talk about uh, after the break about the Ryzen 3000 uh, BIOS updates. Um, because, man, uh, processors have gotten really complicated and keeping them cool is a really interesting process, but um, no pun intended. Yeah, I'm. Uh, eh. <laughs> well, no more in October. I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Um, that's. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I also like the idea that liquid cooling, uh, or completely unhinged air cooling rigs, may be really important again later this year. That just makes me happy, um, <laughs> for no particularly at, intelligent reason. <laughs> at the top end, for sure. Yeah. Cooling yeah. cooling's coming back. And, and I will say, too, uh, that when Intel's been demoing this 9900KS, unlike some of their previous controversies, or like when they had that 56-core or 56-thread uh, uh, Xeon W part uh, that, would, that required like uh, a refrigerator to cool it, they were cooling this in their demos on a core, I think it was a Corsair 240 all-in-one. So, you know, that's stuff that's reasonable. easily accessible, reasonable, right. nothing ex nothing exotic required to keep this uh, cool at five speaker, it's all core. We've included a full-time 24-hour-a-day flotilla of engineers to pour <laughs> liquid nitrogen into this processor so that you can enjoy the performance you've come to expect from Intel. Yeah, I can't wait to see the number on that one. Oh, my goodness, this episode of This Week in Computer Hardware brought to you by Plex. Plex brings together all the media that matters to you in a single app. It's available on any device, no matter where you are. It is the solution. Organize and stream your personal collection of movies, TV shows, music, and photos for free. You can also stream your favorite podcasts, web series, and news also free. And if you upgrade to a Plex Pass, it's less than 5 bucks a month. You'll get the best of Plex with exclusive and early access to premium features like offline accessibility, right? Plex lets you download your movies, your shows, your music, your photos, your mobile devices, so you can enjoy them wherever you go, even if you're offline and severely without internet, which is something that appeals to me, given my uh, soon-to-be rapidly mobile lifestyle. You can watch live broadcast TV and DVR with a Plex Pass, an antenna, and a tuner. You can enjoy great TV without paying for cable which, again, is going to be really cool when the Olympics roll around. Customized news. The news feature in Plex, right? They've got quick access to over 190 and counting uh, sources for national, international, and local news. We're talking about like 80% of the U.S. markets. That goes out to supported Plex streaming players. You can enjoy premium music features like lyrics and custom curated playlists based on your personal music preferences. You know, if you want to get a cinema-like experience when you're watching your personal movie collection, trailers, behind-the-scene features, never-before-seen footage, they've got it built in. And it is so much easier to switch users with Plex Home. You can create customized, managed accounts. Switching users can be so easy if there's a whole bunch of people in your house that are using Plex. They even have parental controls so you can safely let your little ones enjoy too. Plex Pass also gets you Plex Pass perks where you get exclusive access to promos and discounts on partner products, and you get to use the newest features before everyone else, which is pretty cool. Cut the cable cord and save big. Plex is offering Twit listeners a 30 day free trial of Plex Pass, which gives you access to all their premium features. Go to plex.tv slash twit and enter code TWIT to start your free trial of Plex Pass today. That's plex.tv slash twit and enter the code TWIT to start your free trial. We want to thank Plex for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. And if you haven't checked it out, you should. Plex.tv slash twit. Go check it out. The uh, <laughs> Ryzen 3000 BIOS fixes boost frequencies. Um, <laughs> but maybe boosting... The wrong cores. Uh, you pulled up an article um, from Tom's Hardware uh, from Paula, Paula Alcorn. Um, 
this uh, is this an engineering oops, or is this something somebody may have done to make something look like it was doing things it wasn't actually doing? I mean, because the Tom's Hardware article says that the CPU is boosting cores that aren't doing any work, um, which sounds right. thrilling, but doesn't actually do anything <laughs> for the apps you're running. Um, uh, yeah, I don't think this know. was uh, intentional. I don't think this was malicious. Okay. I, and, and I'm not even sure this is AMD's fault. This may be a Windows scheduler okay. issue because, you know, Lord knows that those have been been challenging uh, trying to get that to work as these core counts have increased. But basically to right. recap real quick, Ryzen 3000 processors came out uh, in July. And over these first few months, there's been a flurry of, of updates, uh, uh, GISA and, and BIOS updates to the, to the uh, boards. And to the microcode and all that, and and uh, and the recently people noticed that one of the recent updates lowered their frequencies, and that they weren't there was like a hard cap on voltage, which was preventing the processor from hitting uh, the rated boost frequency. So then AMD like changed their marketing to say, well, we meant, you know it's it's not guaranteed; it's a maximum potential boost. But the question was why. And AMD came out with a, an update. There was a blog post that uh, Robert Halleck uh, made to kind of explain that it was it wasn't intentional and they were going to fix it. And they said there was there would be a fix out by the end of the month. And sure enough, well well before the end of the month, these these BIOS updates started hitting uh, motherboard manufacturers. And so Paul uh, over at uh, Tom's Hardware was was testing it. We haven't been able to test this because Sebastian has our 3900X and he's uh, on a beach somewhere, I imagine. But uh, the, uh, from from his perspective over at uh, Tom's Hardware, they said, well, okay, well, we started testing it, and yeah, the, the clocks are hitting. You know, it's going back up to mm -hmm. a 4.6 gigahertz, but we, we're not getting better performance in our actual benchmark or our app or whatever we're using to measure performance. And so they started looking at, at individual co uh, uh, clock frequencies and, and kind of uh, digging in, and they found that in some workloads, not in all, that you're you're doing all the work on like for a single threaded task you're doing all the work on on core zero, but core one boosts to four point six. Core zero is stuck at four three, but core zero is at four six. So your hardware monitor says, oh, I hit I hit four point six. See everything's fine, <laughs> but but your results don't actually change. You know it's not actually doing the work. And so uh, I think there's there's more that needs to be done here. There may be additional updates that AMD needs to release. Uh, there's, as I said, there's speculation that it could be a Windows scheduler problem where Windows is not choosing, it's not assigning the work to the correct cores. Uh, and we saw this early on to throughout previous generations of Ryzen where you get a, uh, a very high performance or high threaded chip like the Threadripper uh, 2990WX and the performance in Windows isn't that great, but you put it on Linux with a good scheduler and it's phenomenal. And so that's that's what we're kind of looking at here. So at, at the very least, there's there's no danger. This isn't going to harm your processor. There's no risk. But if you get this new AGIS updates, it's the uh, the ABBA update or ABBA. <laughs> so take a chance on on ABBA. But uh, uh, you know to test it out. And, and and worst case scenario, nothing gets better in terms of your actual performance. Uh, but, but you know, best case scenario, it does fix it because, like I said, it, it, this wasn't in every every workload, and I'm sure I'm sure we'll have more updates. This is a, an evolving process. Uh, we'll have more more uh, more BIOS updates, more Windows updates to to kind of continue to fine tune performance. It's also, I mean, it has to be a challenge at this point, given the relative rapidity of changes inside of Windows 10 with the subscription model they're going on right now. I imagine that for some of the more arcane stuff, it's probably. Or I should say, as a consumer, and having talked to some people in enterprise environments that have Windows 10, and knowing how maddening it can be to deal with massive operating system updates, I can't imagine it's trivial to deal with some of this stuff um, when you're, you know, trying to do massive changes to the firmware, which of course then has to go through the motherboard vendor before it gets to you. Um, sort of deal with this uh, in the face of Windows changes, uh, Windows 10. The shifting tides of Windows 10, if you will. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I thought it was also interesting that uh, AMD had sort of dismissed the reliability concerns. There's a link to Too Hot to Last uh, investigating Intel's claims about Ryzen reliability. Another Paul Alcorn article up on Tom's Hardware. Um, this is uh, 
um, you know, Intel kind of went on the offensive, or I should just say the attack, uh, you know, that they were, uh, that basically saying that AMD was reducing frequencies intentionally because their processors weren't going to last long term uh, uh, without reducing the frequencies that chips are running at, which, uh, you know, comes back to some of the reporting uh, from Der Bauer. Um, you know, basically it was the idea that Intel took advantage of Der Bauer's reporting not to claim that AMD had a technical issue, but that AMD was actually intentionally slowing down their processors so they would have a decent lifespan. Um, if I were being snarky, I might say for a company that's had so much trouble getting onto the next generation process, they might want to concentrate on working on their own problems <laughs> rather than inventing ones for other people. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, it, it is interesting, right? Because AMD has confirmed that there are rising processors where, you know, certain cores don't hit certain frequencies. Um, or as Mr. Alcorn writes, uh, come with a mix of fast and slow cores, meaning not all cores are capable of hitting the rated single-threaded boost frequencies. Um, which is interesting, because uh, I've, I've explained a couple times to people where they were like, I'm not getting, well, your boost frequency, on, especially on an Intel processor, is generally for one core for a very short period of time, which is mm -hmm. fascinating and actually does tremendous things for the user experience in certain situations, but it's not the same thing as being able to max out all four cores at this incredibly high speed when you're, say, rendering two hours of video. So it's, it's interesting because for the vast majority of users aren't doing anything profoundly taxing on their CPUs. And Intel has, they went, they spent a lot of time sort of hyper customizing the behavior of their processors so that the least amount of energy could be consumed to do the maximum amount of this seems faster for the end user, which all works great until you start trying to fire everything up, uh, you know. To 100% and it just doesn't happen, or 100% is a significantly lower uh, core speed than you expected. And that's even before, for example, in the case of laptops, where you have a, I will call, uh, I will, I will graciously say, aggressive attempt to minimize noise coming from, say, a Surface tablet that ends up throttling mm -hmm. the performance of the chip down to an unusable level. Um, I know I've harped on that one a lot over the last couple of years, but really, you know, a, a state of the art. Core i7 laptop uh, where you can literally open up three or four, you know, windows in Chrome and start typing and actually have the machine start to do that 1987 thing where you're <laughs> typing faster than the words are showing up on the screen. This is a problem. That was an extreme case. Um, but, you know, nobody wants their $3,500 state-of-the-art system to get spanked in a simple benchmark by something with a Core i5. That's two years old and has half as much memory. That's that's not progress. <laughs> right, right. So, you know, uh, Intel's a street fighting kind of place, and they continue to fight on the street with whatever tools they have. As you would expect. Remember Huawei? To. Yeah, no, and you know, it's it's to their credit. I just keep the engineers moving forward. Let's see what those next two generations of processors do. You know, I would yeah. love to see Intel and AMD in this long running battles, you know, circa 1995, where they're, you know, fighting back and forth with legitimate challenges to each other and, and keeping, uh, you know, I like, I like, I like big changes between gener, big performance gains between generations and enough competition to keep the prices down. So it's yep. my dream people. Uh, Remember Huawei? Huawei, who has effectively been kicked out of the U.S. Uh, and kicked out of using U.S. products. Uh, they dropped their massive, we're talking about 6.5 inch, 6.53 uh, inch screen. Uh, really good article on this on 9 to 5 Google. Um, Mate 30 Pro. And uh, Damian Wilde wrote their article up at, at 9 to 5 Google. Um, it is a it is a interesting style of a phone, as you can see from this very fuzzy picture if you're watching the video. Uh, it is a beast, right? 6.53 inch screen. Um, and the hardware specs, like a Kirin 990 chipset, 8 gigabytes of RAM, a 4,500 milliamp hour battery, uh, fast charging, like 17 watt fast charging with a 40 watt charger in the box. Uh, the proprietary Huawei NM card for expansion, which I'm not a fan of, but at least you can expand it, uh, you know, beyond the 128 uh, gigabyte version at the low end. Um, there's no Google apps on this, right? That's 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 part of what's happening uh, uh, with them being shut out of using uh, U.S. apps. No Google apps, no access to the Play Store or Play services, period. So 
anybody who buys this is going to learn how to sideload apps or they're going to be using exactly what showed up on the phone when it came out of the box. Um, interesting choice on the screen, 88 degree curved edges, um, which I think, you know, based on some comments online, people who either love or absolutely despise, um, does the similar vibrating screen speaker at the P30 did, uh, the camera is kind of unhinged, right? Dual 40 megapixel sensors, one super wide angle f1.8 and a wide angle f1.5 with optical image stabilization. Uh, and then an eight megapixel uh, zoom, uh, like f.24 zoom as the third camera, which had me thinking about the iPhone 11, um, you know, except it's center and doesn't have a giant bump. It just has a ridiculous circle around it. I, you may pick up as we move forward in the show that uh, I am amused and horrified by some of the design choices. Uh, a little bit of a notch on the top of the screen on that one. Um, you won't be buying it in the U.S., but I just wanted to give a shout out that Huawei was uh, continuing to build phones. And uh, I, I will be very curious to see what happens, uh, both from a user experience with users. Uh, you know, it's one thing to sideload apps if you're an enthusiast. It's something entirely, again, if you're, say, um, you know, my neighbor. Um and uh, I'm how, very curious how about to see that also with that for security. <laughs> I have complicated feels about slow motion cameras because, you know, whenever there's a feature like that on my phone, one of my children finds it and suddenly there's like nine <laughs> gigabytes of that peculiar feature on the phone. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's pretty impressive overall. Um, they're, they're, they're claiming 7,680 frames per second at 720p. At yeah, it sounds super aggressive. I I would be very curious to see what the end results look like and how they're doing that. Um, and, and I have to say, I I cannot believe that is true frame rate because even the red cameras that do slow yeah. motion, they they do it at like a quarter of their rated speed and then do interpolation right. to fill it in. So it's got to they got to be smell doing a something. lot of interpolation, <laughs> or perhaps yeah. you know, delaying the frame uh, several times in the process. Yeah, no, that's. Uh, Given what an actual slow motion camera that runs at that speed costs, I feel that that is an aggressive claim and there must be some curious things going on in the back end. I do like the yeah. giant lens stacks uh, if you're looking at the video right now. They're, they're not giant in terms of sticking out of the back of the camera, but they're showing all of the layers of the optics inside the camera. Um, yeah, it's a bummer. It's not going to be showing up in the United States, and I'm very, very curious to see what uh, that sideloading app situation does for security uh, for their end users. Mm. Um, Stout and Smith, I want to say, uh, you found this one. Um, they're actually like early hands on. Um, th there may actually be six gigabytes in the RAM in the new iPhone 11, but two gigabytes of it is locked down for the cameras. That's crazy. And, and that that's speculation. Just want to be clear, we're not not right. entirely sure because, uh, as you recall, when when the iPhone 11s were announced, uh, people came out and said uh, immediately. So they must have been involved. Okay, you know, must have been somewhere in the chain. They said, "Oh, well, the the regular iPhone 11s have four gigs. The Pros have six. And then okay. now the phones are going to get out there, and they're looking at the the Geekbench. Or they're hooking it up to Xcode. It's only showing four on the Pros." Uh, so Stephen Trouton Smith, who's a well, you know, well known. If you if you follow the Apple uh, sphere, he does leaks and analysis. Uh, he he was tweeting uh, yesterday that that uh, you know there's some speculation because he came out and said, oh no, it's truly just four. And then I guess somebody kind of pulled him aside and said something to him. He said, well, okay, there actually might be six gigs in there. But two of it is reserved for all that camera magic that Apple's doing, all this night processing and and uh, uh, you know, background blurring and all the all the advanced uh, stuff that they're doing with all this new camera uh, camera apps and camera technology, it could be that that it is there. So for all intents and purposes, from a user perspective, it's probably going to be four. But uh, but who right. knows? If, and if if there is that dedicated memory, that's great because then you're not you know taxing the rest of your system to to do those advanced features when you're processing video and stuff. Right. No, that's good. I, one of the first comments on that was, uh, you know, if that means all my apps won't be killed whenever I open the camera, I'd be so damn <laughs> happy. Yeah. Um, fairly reasonable response on that one. Um, early uh, iPhone 11 reviews starting to pop in. I thought it was interesting. Brian X Chen over at the New York Times um, 
Not that I generally get a lot of my technical information from the New York Times, but I thought this was a really interesting, uh, you know, the, the, kind of the second half of the title, Thinking Differently in the Golden Age of Smartphones. Um, I'm just going to quote the article. But with this review of the iPhone 11, 11 Pro and 11 Pro Max, which Apple unveiled last week and will become available Friday, I'm encouraging a different approach. The bottom line, it's time to reset our upgrade criteria. And traditionally, he's been like, yeah, if your phone's more than your iPhone's more than two years old, upgrade to the new one. He says the bottom line, uh, you know, the latest iPhones just aren't a big leap forward from last year's iPhones or even the iPhone X from 2017 or the iPhone 10 from 2017. Uh, he says, definitely upgraded from devices five years old. 11 is a significant upgrade from the 6 and 6 Plus. Not the 6S and the 6S Plus, but literally, uh, you know, the, the phones of choice of 214, or 214 2014. Um, you know, and I mean, I'll be honest with you, there's, I, I find it so frustrating um, as someone who likes to carry a ridiculous amount of music stored locally on my phone. Uh, you know, I've got like a 400 gigabyte micro SD card in my uh, suffering uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Motorola G6. Um, I find it really frustrating, like the lack of, of, of capacity on a lot of the high, the high end phones or the lack of ability to expand capacity with micro SD cards uh, or anything. Um, and it was interesting to look at like they do a really good job of kind of showing these extraordinary, you know, demos when they launch these phones but a lot of the real world difference especially in the processors and some of the you know the high-end camera stuff um i'll be honest with you it was kind of sort of being lost on me three or four years ago when i'm like okay I'm, it's a thousand dollars and i don't have a headphone jack and i don't have this and i can't and then um i i, I you know it's become a very incremental evolutionary, not revolutionary sort of change from year to year on a lot of the phones. And I just thought it was kind of nice to see some, someone, someone so directly be like, stop upgrading every two years unless this is your hobby. Uh, and if it is your hobby, just acknowledge it. <laughs> right. Um, well, and I think I that know. this is that he's, he's acknowledging, I mean, he's not just right. giving a, 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 an opinion going forward. This has been the trend. This is why, Apple, uh, you know, why sales went down. This is why Apple so aggressively pushed their iPhone upgrade program. Uh, you know, people don't need to upgrade. I mean, obviously, I'm going to upgrade every year. And, um, you know, my, my wife, I get her a new phone pretty frequently, more than she needs, but just because I want to play with it first. Uh, so, the, you know, <laughs> we're not the market. But for the broad market out there, yeah, you don't. It's it's like computers. I mean, you can, you can buy a... Right a laptop with like an i7 and an SSD from 2012 and it's still fine today. And when if you look at any other 7 year period prior to that and it would have been a huge difference. You you would have right. been itching for an upgrade already. And so we've reached a point where what we're doing has not caught up or, or has fallen I'm sorry what we're doing is lagged behind the advance uh, the, the pace of advancement in in performance uh, for for most people. Obviously if you're really pushing these things if you if you right. if you need that camera because this is you want this to be your only camera your only video camera then yeah you're going to be interested every year but uh, but yeah I mean your 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 less technically savvy uh, friends uh, and, and relatives of course I mean uh, why who's going to be out there shooting multi stream video on their iPhone that that doesn't already know what they need <laughs> that's a really good question um, I don't know and you know I also I will say. Uh, it's nice to see Apple dialing back the prices a little bit on these. Not a lot, uh, but at least they're, they're, there's not heart-stopping jumps in cost between generations. In fact, they went down a little bit on this one, which was uh, kind of shocking to me uh, and kind of delightful. Uh, early reviews, the Apple Watch Series 5 pretty much come down to the battery life is the same. Uh, there's not much new that people really care about, uh, but the always on screen is is getting rave reviews. People are really excited about that, which I think actually makes sense to me. I would also probably explain the uh, the battery life uh, not changing much, but um, no super rush to, to be on that. But Apple certainly still has a huge lead, I think, over anybody in the smartwatch universe. I don't think that's uh, going to change anytime soon. Um Verge calls it the most uh, leaked phone ever, and uh, that would be the Pixel 4. The rumors are coming hot and heavy on that. The actual announcement isn't until October 15th, uh, but there's pretty solid rumors on the CPU, which, of course, is going to be the 855, unless there's a new chip we don't know about, which I'm doubtful on because I don't think 
uh, I don't think Google sells enough of these phones to justify getting the first launch on a new CPU. Six gigabytes of RAM. Um, Store is going to be 64 and 128 again, which I think is too low. Uh, interesting choice of a 90 hertz refresh rate on the screen. At least two cameras and an affectionately iPhone 11 like bump on that one. Uh, cameras uh, looking pretty impressive. Uh, in the, the Verge article, they had this great astrophotography shot from XDA developers. That was just astonishing. Uh, you know, cam I don't really get excited about a lot of the camera differences these days because a lot of them are subtle. I do think compared to three or four years ago, the low light performance on cameras is extraordinary. Um, but this is doing uh, a super tight, or I should say a, a super wide nighttime star shot. And the noise reduction and the quality of the image uh, between the two is astonishing. Um, and that, that actually has me a little excited. I would be really excited about this phone uh, if it wasn't capped at 128 gigabytes of RAM. It's probably too fuzzy to see it, but it's worth uh, going to The Verge to read the article uh, and to take a look at that slider over to XDA developers. But you kind of get the general idea if you're watching uh, the video of Twitch right now. The uh, I'll give you a hint. The blue one is the good one, and the one that looks like kind of pale yellow in the center is the not good one. <laughs> um Definitely going to be some kind of face unlocking tech that is not going to require a swipe after uh, it looks at your face. Uh, and they finally are releasing the Soli chip, which is their motion sensor, hand gestures, screen control. Really, really curious to see uh, how that works in the real world because I have traditionally been profoundly underwhelmed by, uh, well, if you're watching the video, hands waving to do things on screens. Uh, on desktops, on living room televisions, and pretty much everywhere else. Um, much like the iPhone 11, there will be no 5G. There's a slim possibility, but there's just I don't think there's enough 5G uh, available at this point uh, for Google to care about it for the Pixel, um, which I think is fine. It's going to be another year on 5G, and 5G itself is problematic for reasons I won't talk about again, lest I get a bunch of tweets um <laughs> saying stop we get it it's really complicated uh if you have never heard of it there's a thing called a portal it's from facebook and for people who like to invite facebook into their homes in a more invasive way than might normally come through their phone or their browser this is your hardware of choice um what you're looking at right now is the second generation portal um essentially uh they are the same as the first ones which are essentially uh facetime on a device that sits in your home and is run by uh, Facebook. Um, now supports WhatsApp. Um, some price cuts on there from, I want to say, $199 to $179 and a new $129 Portal Mini. Uh, and it turns out, like with everybody else, contractors were listening to Portal to make things better in the future. Uh, you'll apparently be able to turn that off now. Uh, they also have added on the new portals a mechanical shutter for the camera and lights to indicate the microphone is on, so you have a better chance of knowing if people are doing peculiar stuff in your house. Uh, the original 15.6-inch portal, which is massive, uh, but kind of fascinating the way it, it's designed to sort of track you around the room. It's down from uh, $349. It's now $279. I'll be honest with you. I have never seen one of these used outside of a YouTube channel uh, advertisements where they, for like literally I saw a bunch of them when they launched the device, um, or at least a bunch of them on the same channel when they launched the device. But I literally do not know a single human being that is using one of these. So if you are running uh, Facebook's portal in your home uh, and you have opinions on it, do us a favor, email twitch at twit.tv and let us know what you think. Because I'm, I'm kind of curious if anybody out there is using them and if you care about them. And hey, if you never want to hear about this again because you have a phone with a video communication app on it or you use Skype, you can also email twitch at twit.tv.com and uh, tell us to stop talking about this stuff or just ask us a tech question. We like those too. Um, Portal.facebook.com, Amazon Best Buy are the sources on these. Uh, I have absolutely no plans of testing one of these because, to be perfectly honest with you, I just don't want Facebook to be that present in my house. <laughs> exactly. I mean, who who wants more Facebook in their life? Please. <clears throat> you know, they got a second generation product, so there must be a fairly intense group of people who want it. Um, I'll be kind of curious to 
to see uh, if these make it to a third generation. Uh, if you're looking at the video right now, you can kind of see the two basic screen models and then something that looks like sort of a squashed something. That's the Portal TV, which is a $149 box. To bring video chat to your TV using Facebook's Portal service, which sounds so disturbingly 1999 to me. Um, you know, it's... Uh, Web TV, baby. I would l yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a bad... Bad, bad flashback. Uh, Do you hear that uh, Mike Muller is retiring from ARM? I didn't. No, when did that happen? Uh, end of oh, September. Oh, I see you have it at the... I'm, I'm sorry, I saw the... Uh, <laughs> there was a note in our show notes. I should have... I missed that. It's okay. It was It was huh. the very last thing. I was, I was kind of fascinated because... Uh, uh, He's one of the 16 people that co-founded ARM. I, you know, I was, I was laughing because I think the note next to it was speaking of people that helped change how and where we use computers uh, and certainly put a hurt on Intel. Um, Mike Muller is the CTO of 20 years uh, at, uh, at AMD and uh, one of the 16 co-founders of AMD. Um, you know, if you're um. wondering, uh, yeah, <laughs> if you like cell phone performance, thank that man. <laughs> If you've massively reduced, you know, the power consumption and cooling requirements for your organization's server farm by using ARM processors, thank that man. Um, yeah, I, I was just kind of fascinated by that one. Um, you know, also, uh, uh, you know, the idea of having one CTO for 20 years sounds pretty amazing to me, uh, given the uh, way things change in the industry. So just a big shout out to him. They also... Uh, uh, Arm uh, didn't have any comments on who might be replacing him, so that's got to be an interesting. I mean, just <laughs> the majority of the processing in the world right now, I think, is done with Arm processors. Uh, certainly, the ones that involve people staring at screens and not say the little tiny processors inside of uh, closed circuit television cameras used for security. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was just I, shout out. There's that's somebody who a lot of people don't know about who fundamentally changed how we compute and where we compute, um, and certainly taught Intel a lesson in paying attention to your smaller customers or your smaller competitors. Oh my goodness! <laughs> um, PCPer.com, you're the managing editor. Is there anything you can tease that's coming up in the near future? Anything you want to give a shout out to? I wasn't prepared for that. Uh, I mean, we, I'm so sorry. We're going to be the PC product. We're going to be looking at. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to be looking at uh, more of these Ice Lake systems, testing actual like power consumption, battery life, which is something we haven't haven't touched on yet. We've got some NAS reviews coming up. A uh, uh, little QNAP NAS that uh, uses M.2 storage exclusively, uh, with built-in 10 gigabit networking. Really? So that's that's neat. Oh wow! Yeah, it's a nice little box. Uh, so we've, we've, you know, we've got some some uh, some cool stuff coming up, and Sebastian will be back off vacation next uh, on Monday, so be happy to have him back. But uh, yeah, uh, you know, check out our hardware leaderboard uh, over at PCPro.com if you want some recommendations on how to build. A, we've, we've got three uh, systems there, and uh, you can uh, take a look at the different components. And uh, yeah, sorry, I, <laughs> I'm not used to being on the no. show. I wasn't prepared for that question. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> It's my fault for not briefing you on that one. So oh, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! What's your uh, what's your Twitter handle? Where can people follow you on the Twitters? Uh, so I'm not I'm not as active on Twitter as I should be, but uh, if you do okay. want to follow me there, it's Jim Tanis. Uh, no no uh, space, just J I M T A N O U S. And uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, otherwise uh, email Jim at PCPro.com. Uh, or the article comments or YouTube comments over at our, our our pages there. So, very cool. Well, thank you for making the time to thank you for making the time to give Sebastian the time to take a day off this week. And uh, <laughs> he earned it. That guy, I, he's been working nonstop for nine months, so he uh, that's well deserved. I've had some funny, like odd hour conversations with him <laughs> while he was benchmarking <laughs> stuff. Uh, Nothing says party like benchmarking with a small child growing up in the house. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Oh, you can still find me uh, at Patrick Norton on the Twitters. Uh, and I'll, uh, I got some stuff launching, but I got to deal with we're in the process of moving out of our house uh, and getting that ready to be sold, which has been an exciting thing for me this week because they also pulled up the sewer in front of our house uh, and I had an emergency root canal. So uh, uh, I don't want to whine, but 
wow, it's been an exciting week. And uh, if I've been a little addled on the show this week, I apologize. It wasn't Jim. It was totally me. And uh, I'll do better next week. If this is your first show, welcome this week in computer hardware. We call it Twitch. You can find all the older episodes and how to subscribe over at twit.tv slash twitch. Although you can probably find us in your podcatcher just by searching for this week in computer hardware. And uh, yeah, it's been a fun one. Jim, thank you again so much for making the time for us. It was my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Jim Tannis. We'll catch you next week on Twitch. <laughs>